And joining us now is Jack Mallis. He's the CEO of Strike. Jack, fantastic to have you on the show. I have to say, when I saw this announcement, it completely blew my mind. And no offence to Twitter content providers, it wasn't about them getting tips. Let's just take a step back and explain what the vision is. What does Strike do? Julia, first of all, how are we this morning? Thanks for having me. Um, <laughs> Strike, uh, the thesis we hold at Strike is that Bitcoin, the monetary network, is the best monetary network in human history, Julia. It's the only inherently global monetary network we've ever seen, and it offers finality both instantly and at relatively no cost anywhere in the world. And so we make use of that monetary network as it compares to the Visa monetary network or the Western Union monetary network or the Square monetary network or the PayPal monetary network. And we use the Bitcoin monetary network, not necessarily to speculate on the price, but as financial rails under the hood to make for efficient, free, global, and instant payments. And we're talking about remittance, we're talking about checking out at commerce, we're talking about online tipping, and we make use of this really granular in innovation for humanity in monetary network sense. Okay, so we've got the Bitcoin network. We've also got something called the Lightning Network. And I know you were one of the earliest mm -hmm. developers of this. Let's, before we dig into the details of this global payments network that we're talking about, just explain the importance of the Lightning Network, because I do think my viewers need to understand how much of a game changer that is too when you're talking about particularly efficiency and speed. You got it. Yeah, so everyone's familiar with the mainstream media critiques that Bitcoin is one, right. it's too slow, supposedly, to make use of payments and it's too expensive, right? So the Lightning Network set out to achieve and solve those two variables is one, can we solve the variable of time for finality? Can we make a Bitcoin transaction instant? And then two, can we solve the variable cost? so that a Bitcoin transaction isn't too expensive to buy a cup of coffee. And those were the two optimizations the Lightning Network set out to solve. And so when you take the Bitcoin legacy monetary network and you combine it with the protocol of the Lightning Network, now you have a monetary asset and a monetary network that's inherently global and those two variables solve, where finality can be achieved instantly and finality can be achieved at relatively no cost. Again, no other monetary network in human history can say the same. And that's why it is such a big deal. I mean, this is basically what Facebook was envisaging, I think, with, with Libra, but everyone went, whoa, we don't want to give Facebook that kind of power. Uh, Twitter just seems to, obviously, with, with help, got there first. And I suppose that's no surprise, given Jack Dorsey's um, interest in, in crypto. But can all the big social networks now, in some way, sort of tap into this via the, the capabilities yes. of the Lightning Network? Of course. Let me draw it akin to the internet, Julia, in the sense that all of these companies are tapped into the internet. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, they all use the World Wide Web. They all use HTTPS, TCP IP requests and live on the same standard for communication. Bitcoin as a monetary network is doing the same for money. Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, they can all interface with their users in a monetary, global, instantaneous and free fashion on a singular standard for money in the same way that they operate on the singular standard for communication. Bitcoin network is not an optional monetary network. It is the monetary network to operate for instantaneous global settlement and how different companies, different services, different internet networks like Twitter and Facebook, how they deem to use it is up to them, but is a singular standard in the same way that we don't have a lot of internets. We have one. We won't have a lot of monetary networks. We will have one that offers instantaneous free global settlement. I mean, the key here is, you know, and it was something that I realized when I got to the United States, it was like, um, you want to send somebody money. Do you have Venmo? No. Okay. Do you have PayPal? Uh, yeah, I do. Oh, OK, great. Then I can I can send by paper. Do you have pay Chase Bank? No, but I have Venmo. No one interacted with everybody else. So we needed some way of bringing all these sort of payment systems, these individual payment systems um, together. I think anyone that is involved in sending money from A to B probably sat up and looked at this, whether it's a Visa, a MasterCard, um, a Western Union with remittances, too. I mean, the, 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 the capacity for this to be a game changer for me is is huge. What are the limitations, Jack, as someone who's involved? What are the limitations of this that you can see? The limitations, to be quite frank, is that we're not all onboarded onto the same standard. You're absolutely correct. 
if I have my Venmo account linked to my Twitter account, can I receive a tip from Japan? No, because the Venmo network is closed. Only other Venmo users can tip me, and that's restricted to the United States. If I have my Strike app linked to my Twitter account, can I receive a tip from Japan? Yes. In fact, I just did. And the, we need to get everyone onto the same monetary standard. And let's be clear, that doesn't mean you have to love Bitcoin. That doesn't mean you have to think mm. the Bitcoin price is going to the moon, right? We're using it under the hood. So as a tip comes in from Japan on the Bitcoin rails, Strike's going to take the Bitcoin, auto convert it to dollars and credit you the dollars. So users don't know Bitcoin's being used, but it's an, a standard under the hood. So there's a world not far from here, Julia, where my Venmo account can pay my Cash App account, my Cash App account can pay and tip on Facebook. My Facebook account can tip someone on Instagram. Instagram can tip on Twitter. If we're all on the same standard in the same way that we're all on the same internet, interoperability and connectivity become seamless, easy, global, instant, and free. Yeah, and the point here is that you don't have to accept Bitcoin, for example, if, if it's transferred in Bitcoin, you could accept to receive it in US dollars or Japanese yen, to your point, if it's... Um, if it's coming coming from Japan. OK, so I mentioned in the introduction that it was virtually costless. What is the relative cost? I mean, if you're doing like a transaction on a credit card, the average cost, I guess, is around two and a half percent. How low and what is the cost of using this? And, and if it is so low, Jack, how does Strike make money? Yeah, well, how low can it get? That low. Yeah, race Zero. to the bottom. Zero. <laughs> race to the bottom, baby. Yeah, so let's talk about the two and a half percent of a card processor why it's because all of the legacy fixed costs and intermediaries that's the key point that are required to achieve settlement when i go check out at a starbucks julia the dollars that i'm pledging to pay starbucks don't instantaneously somehow hop out jump out of my debit card and pop into the cash register no there's a lot of intermediaries banks credit association balance sheet float that's required to achieve settlement for Starbucks to actually retain the dollars that I pledged to pay them. And that is why it's two and a half percent. So for Strike, monetizing this is easy. Monetization is built into the system. Instead of a large retailer paying 2.9%, Strike can, we could charge them 0.05% if we want. And all of those 0.05%, it's all cash profit. And no other processing or monetary network can bring prices down that low because of the fixed cost. They'd go out of business. They'd go bankrupt. So Strike, we can be as revolutionary as with tech as we are with pricing. And monetization is built into the system in that sense. And we, to all the legacy monetary networks that just can't compete. Um, and, and it's not instant, but it's far quicker, actually, than, than what we're seeing today in terms of the old payment rails, quite frankly, as any small business owner watching knows it can take days and weeks for for transactions to settle. And that can be a huge problem for, for any business, which is why I think this is also so transformative as well. Um, know your customer. How are you getting around that? Because, you know, I was speaking to the chief legal officer of Gemini, which is a big cryptocurrency exchange, and they were talking about the challenges of know your customer rules when we're talking about the crypto space in particular and, and trying to understand who's doing what, particularly where regulators are concerned. How do you get around that very quickly, Jack? We don't get around anything. We're a regulated entity. We comply with regulation. We take it very, very seriously. And compliance is a big deal. Listen, I mean, we're living in an extraordinarily disruptive time. Imagine a world before the internet. It seems scary. And we're living through a similar dematerialization and disruption that for money. It's the same thing. Uh, and so everyone around the world, whether you're a consumer, a retailer, a business, or a regulator is adapting, learning, uh, and so we good relationships, we're compliant, uh, always looking to learn. Um, and so we're not getting around anything. Uh, we're executing and, and working in lockstep uh, as we should. I should have said, I should have said, how are you handling it rather than getting around it? I didn't mean to infer that you were uh, by, bypassing any rules, Jack. You're sensitive to that. Now, I was going to ask you about El Salvador, but I don't have time. I'm going to have to get you back. I have to ask where you are. You, you look like you're in the most phenomenal walk-in wardrobe in the world, except it's empty. Jack, where, where are you? I am in a giant, empty women's closet. You're exactly correct, Julia. <laughs> Not necessarily a woman's. <laughs> You're right. I guess technically hey. it's a giant, empty men's closet because it's mine. It's a good point. I could point. definitely feel that. Point. I could definitely feel that. <laughs> I'm pleased to say Jack Vallis is back with us, the CEO of Strike. Few technical issues here. And Jack, you is still in the hot seat. So we do get to talk about El Salvador after all. 
Talk to me about what Strike is doing there. So again, Julia, Strike optimizes around this thesis that we now have a global instant free monetary network for the world. El Salvador is an emerging market. It's a developing country. And you're talking about a place where 70, 70, not 17 percent of their citizens don't have a bank account. They don't have access to any monetary network. They're still living on a cash standard like we were 50 years ago. Right. And so what we want to do is make this monetary network accessible to them, give them an access to high quality of life, basic human freedoms to where the cash apps and the Venmos that we're so privileged to here, they don't have access to that and, and make this monetary network extensible to them because a very important point, it's the most inclusive monetary network of all time. It works the same here in this closet as it does in El Salvador. That's a very, very positive and helpful concept to understand. That does not vouch the same for Venmo, like I said. So that's our goal is to make this monetary network extensible, usable, and helpful to people that need it most. I mean, I think that's the allure of cryptocurrencies in general, whether you're talking about Bitcoin or some of the others. It's borderless, it's global, no single nation uh, has jurisdiction or oversight for better or for worse. And that's also at times a challenge too. Um, but just in light of the conversation that, that we've just had, what role really beyond just saying, OK, you can go ahead and allow this and people can create or have their own wallets and, and exchange, does the government need to play? Because, you know, I spoke to the chief of the IMF and she was like, just because something's possible doesn't make it a good idea in terms of making Bitcoin legal tender. Does the government even need to do that, Jack? Give us your wisdom. Um, listen, well, let me actually simply know. What, yeah. Another very powerful, powerful concept, Julia, is that the Bitcoin network, it's an open network. Julia, in the same way that Google could not do anything for the rest of the year and they'd be a better company come January 1st, 2022. How? Because everyone else around the world is making the internet better and every new website that joins the internet makes Google a more valuable company. So if they wanted to, they could just sit on their hands and continue to appreciate in their value proposition because they're in an open network that is the internet. Bitcoin is the same thing. If the government of El Salvador doesn't want to do anything ever again, you know who's making Bitcoin better and their financial infrastructure better? Myself, Jack Dorsey, Twitter now all of a sudden, developers all over the world. So they don't have to but they want to. Why do they want to? It's because they now have access. They don't have to ask permission from any central body, from any counterpart. They have access to a monetary network that acts in their best interest and a monetary asset that acts in their best interest. You're talking about an emerging market that gets absolutely crushed by the expan expansion of monetary supply at central banks. So if I'm a government and my job is to provide a high quality of life to my citizens, there's really no other project I should frankly be spending my time on. So do they have to? No. Should they? Arguably, I think so. I think their efforts in Bitcoin are brave and I'm very supportive of what they're doing. Yeah, it's an alternative when there's a lack of trust in institutions and when you have great volatility and depreciation in your, in your currency anyway, which is why I think sort of certain nations are looking at this and other nations are far slower to react because they sort of have the luxury or the control of not having to worry so much. And there's going to be criticism of me saying that, I think, from, um, from certain quarters, because I know there's criticism of the US dollar and, and monetary policy here. Jack, you mentioned this at the beginning of our conversation, and I do think it's really important. How does any of this tie to the value of cryptocurrencies because I do think we have to talk more and more about cryptocurrencies and the volatility and the price changes that we see there and, and sort of dissociate that or in some way understand the value of the underlying technology and what that represents too. How does the value of Bitcoin change or not change what you're doing? So it's actually a very interesting point. Internally at Strike, we make a divide between Bitcoin, the asset that is typically priced in dollars, and Bitcoin, the network that we deem revolutionary and disruptive to existing monetary networks like a Visa or like a PayPal. Um, and so if Bitcoin was $100 or if Bitcoin was $100,000, I can still get money from here to Japan instantly and at no cost and not even allow the consumer to be aware that I'm using Bitcoin under the hood. So we're unaffected and the network is going to disrupt the world no matter what the Bitcoin price is. Bitcoin, the asset, I expect to go well into the six figures this year. And that's because it is the only asset in human history that we've designed from scratch. We engineered it to be perfect. And so I expect it to appreciate against a global macro environment that's 
quite frankly, absolutely chaotic and asinine. Um, but we think of them as separate technologies and disruptive and innovative in totally different ways. OK, we've already talked about this, but I need you to reiterate it. And we've got about 30 seconds. The foreign exchange risk, the volatility in the price of Bitcoin, Bitcoin if you're trying to convert to dollars at any given point, why is that not important? Why does that not a pain point? Why is that not a pain point? Yeah, so let's walk through our 30 second example. <laughs> I know, Money sorry. <laughs> No, it's okay. Don't apologize. We got this. Money coming in from Japan. We are going to take the Japanese yen, live convert it, zip it to Bitcoin. That's Bitcoin's going to get to this closet instantly and in for free, and we're going to convert it to dollars. Julia, all that took one second. And so we're willing to take price volatility worth one second for that level of disruption. That's not a problem. And that type of balance sheet risk is nothing compared to the services you use today. So it comes easy, Julia, it comes easy. Micro, micro, microscopic exchange risk, foreign exchange risk, if you can do it super fast. Jack, you need more than one Bitcoin to fill that closet. You will be back to speak to us <laughs> again soon. I'm glad, I'm glad to be here. We got to chat again, Jack Mallis, CEO of Strike. Thank you, sir. Great to chat. Out of ball. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Cheers.